Um, but he's going to tell us some cool stuff. So uh, have a round of applause and uh, let's enjoy it. Hi, Brian. I don't know. You can call me Axon. I've been in the uh, Kansas City hacker community since about 1993. Eat the mic. Eat the mic. Uh, with the help of some local hackers, I founded a text file easing that turned into a blog. It's called HIR Information Report. Uh, thanks, Joel. Thanks, Frogman, a couple others. Uh, for working for play, I mess with stuff that really blurs the line between uh, red team and blue team, but I'm mostly a tabby wrangler at the office these days. Uh, contact information is up here in the nerdiest format I could muster. Today I'm going to be talking about honey nets. Uh, these are centrally organized, uh, controlled networks of honeypots. And honeypots are decoy systems. Uh, you can deploy these to uh, a virtual machine environment, to your DMZ, uh, play with them in a lab, and that's kind of how I got started. Uh, these are designed to look like tasty targets for any attackers. Um, and, uh, you know, like I said, they're pretty much just decoys. And why do I keep getting... Yeah, glitches here. Whatever. Uh, let's keep going like this. I guess. Sorry, I need to cheat and use my notes. All right. Uh, usually, no legitimate services are offered on honeypots. Uh, so, pretty much any network traffic to or from these systems is uh, is considered suspicious. Now, uh, honey nets and honeypots have a couple of different purposes. Uh, the first one is to distract attackers with some kind of soft target. Uh, you guys are all probably tired as heck of seeing this thing, but uh, here we are. Uh, you know, this is just to sidetrack them before they attack something important. Uh, can also alert the SOC staff, uh, you know, call in Mr. The Plague, uh, automated blocking, and for research. <coughs> Well, let's make one thing clear. Uh, attack data is not threat intelligence. Um, you know, a feed of honey net data will help you pinpoint bad actors on the internet. Uh, but bots and scanners are kind of the internet's equivalent of background radiation. And you're looking through a McDonald's straw at the, at, the, uh, at the whole universe here with each one of your honey nets. Um, so you're going to have to try harder if you want like a full-blown threat intel feed from something like this. <coughs> It seems like development kind of stalled out a couple of years ago with the uh, various HoneyNet projects. Um, behold a wasteland of projects that used to be active that really aren't maintained anymore. Uh, these are some popular ones, uh, but a lot of these are code complete still. Uh, they work fine, it's just nobody's touched them in ages. Uh, so sometimes they don't work well with new flavors of Linux, with System D, or what have you. I'll come back to some of these in just a bit. So uh, there are a few that are still in active development or are newly developed. Um, Kauri is kind of an interesting case. Uh, the developers stopped working on it, and it was a SSH honeypot. It gives you a shell with almost any username and password you enter. Um, development stopped, a guy forked it, he called it Kippo. That guy stopped, and the original author uh, decided to take it back, wrapped up all the changes, and kept adding. And he added a, a, a Telnet honeypot to it as well. So now you've got a fake server that responds fine on Telnet and SSH. Uh, looks yeah. like a real live, yeah. Looks like a real live system uh, running Ubuntu or what have you. Um, and uh, oh, I'm sorry, here was my train of thought. Um, but uh, it does a lot of logging. It's got. I've got I'll get into that in just a second. Um, Telnet Logger is a new one by Robert Graham. It's, uh, it was released about a year ago, uh, designed to kind of trap the Mirai botnets. Um, that, one's, that one's pretty new, but it's, uh, it's fairly feature incomplete. Uh, Honeybits and Honey Lambda are uh, kind of new ways to use Amazon EC2 and uh, Lambda uh, to provide honey tokens uh, so that you can see if some of your data is leaking. You put these things on your network and if you see these tokens show up someplace else, uh, you know that somebody has been in your network. Uh, last, there's Port Lurker, which kind of took over where Port, uh, port I can't remember which one. Uh, it's kind of, uh, yeah, Port Sentry took off. Um, port Sentry hasn't been touched in like 17 years, and so Port Lurker seems to be kind of the new one of those. Uh, anyway, oh, hold on, sorry about that. 
Uh, for this talk, I'm going to focus on the honey pots that can really be used uh, centrally and, and managed centrally. Um, because that's really the point of honey nets, right? You want everything to communicate back to a central hub. Uh, and that brings us to HB Feeds, which is a lightweight, authenticated data feed protocol designed specifically for honey pots. And uh, it came to prominence in the days of HoneyCloud and HP Friends uh, sometime around 2012, 2013. And it was the core of that HP Friends data sharing network. I really miss that. Um, you could just get a live feed of, uh, of attack data from HP Friends around the clock, and it was really cool to see all that happen. Um, HP Feeds integration is found in almost any of the honey pots that got really popular about five years ago. Um, and so, you know, a lot of these honey pots that stop being developed still have HP Feeds support. Uh, but if you're looking to collect data from a honey net, HP Feeds is a pretty good way to go. And uh, so I focused on Modern Honey Net, which is a project from ThreatStream. Uh, they got bought by Anomaly recently, so it's uh, development stalled again uh, on this. But it's still a neat tool. Um, there's only been a few commits and fixes here and there. I've submitted three or four pull requests. Nothing has gotten merged. Uh, but it's mostly complete, even if it's not as modern as it once was. It ties that Honey Net uh, concept together really well. So it's got a built-in HP Feeds broker. Uh, it's got a data normalization and web API uh, for you to uh, get reports from. Uh, gives you the, ta the attack statistics, which you saw kind of on the other side over here. And uh, it's got automated deploy scripts, and they're written in shell and Python, so they're really easy to manage, to hack, to tweak, um, or to fix, because nothing's been touched in a couple of years. Um, and it, it, at its peak, it supported about a dozen honeypot packages. In reality, right now, uh, it's got like five or six that are really uh, well supported. Uh, the back end is all MongoDB, uh, so you can run some cool reports on the MHN server itself. But with some of these tools, like the HP feeds output and with the web API, you can get some pretty cool reports out of it just remotely, just from pulling the feeds off of it. <laughs> So a lot of folks that I've talked to have asked, is it safe to put this honey net or honey pot on my home network? Uh, or can I run one of these at the office? And so here's just a couple of, uh, a little bit of guidance here. Um, you'll want it in the DMZ. You won't want it, uh, you know, sitting on the same VM server as some of your uh, sensitive production assets. Um, <clears throat> If you put it in the cloud, have some isolated VPCs um, where it can't, if, if the attacker gets root access or something on it, it's not going to expose any of your private data. Um, use egress filtering to kind of limit the spread that somebody can do if they do end up compromising it. And uh, uh, things that you don't want to do is uh, install it without permission or, again, you know, um, you know, put it on your home network and just port forward everything through. Uh, you know, people could probably get into the rest of your stuff at home if you're not very careful. Um, but running it at home in, in a DMZ, like if you've got something that's not just a uh, consumer grade router and you've got a real DMZ, you could put one of these uh, on a Raspberry Pi and it works really well. So into the actual honey pots, uh, I kind of discussed Kauri and Kippo. Um, they're a high interaction honeypot. You really can't tell that you're not on an SSH or Telnet server. It looks like you've got a full interactive shell. It looks like you're root. Um, it will troll you if you try and do things like add users. Uh, like, what's your favorite movie? Like, really? Um, but uh, it, overall, it really does look realistic. It's realistic enough that uh, the bots and the script kiddies uh, are, able to, are able to interact with it, and they think it might be a real system. Uh, the cool thing is, is that uh, it really does limit the damage you can do. They can't delete files even though they're root. Um, you know, they, they can't really add users, and when they log off, everything is back to normal. Uh, the next person that logs in gets a pristine environment. Um, it does keep detailed replay logs, so you can actually go back and look at exactly what the attacker typed in real time. Um, and uh, it keeps a log for every single connection that's made. So it's pretty slick. So while the attackers can't do a lot of damage or persistent changes to the shell environment, they can use it as a jump point to do other attacks, and occasionally they do. Um, you know, 
uh, it does have CLI, it does do curl, it does do wget, it, it downloads the files that the attacker tries to download, it stores them in a directory, it doesn't let them execute those scripts that they download, but it still makes that connection and downloads something. Uh, and so, uh, I actually had one of my Raspberry Pis, um, somebody put a uh, telnet it in, ran an expect script, and started downloading tons of ads, and I was basically participating in an ad, ad fraud uh, click network, which was super frustrating. Um, also, uh, Calry and Kippo both allow you to do SSH tunneling and forwarding. Uh, I think the way MHN deploys it is disabled by default. So Dianea and Amon are both medium interaction honeypots, uh, inspired by a really old one called Nephanes. Um, that was one of the earliest honeypots designed to ca capture malware samples and worms. Uh, those honeypots those honey emulate just enough of some popular protocols to encourage a worm or a bot to try and spread. So, uh, you know, they'll try, uh, a lot of these bots are trying eternal blue, like I've got one, uh, one bot or one honeypot in uh, uh, South Korea. It's just getting blown up by Eternal Blue all day long. Uh, and uh, some of these will try to accept files over SMB and FTP, and it catalogs those files and lets you, uh, um, lets you analyze the malware as it tries to spread. Uh, some of these have hooks for uh, integrating with Cuckoo or with VirusTotal, uh, so you can actually have a lot of fun with that. Uh, well. So WordPot, uh, ShockPot, and ConPot are all HTTP honeypots. Uh, they emulate vulnerable web services. Um, obviously, WordPot is a WordPress honeypot. It really only reports attacks that look like WordPress attacks. So Tim Thumb or um, XML uh, login attempts, uh, brute force attacks. Um, ShockPot looks like a default Apache web server, and it really only reports when it sees a Shellshock style attack. But when you look at the logs for these, you're seeing all the scanners, you're seeing a lot of cold fusion, you're seeing a lot of other things. Um, they don't report a lot of that. Uh, the exception is ConPot, which reports every single HTTP connection as an attack, uh, which is a way to get a whole lot of noise in your honey net. Don't really recommend it. Um, the uh, ConPot, though, also emulates the Siemens S7 and Modbus over IP protocols. Uh, and so that's kind of an interesting one to deploy uh, in a SCADA type environment or to find SCADA scanners. Um, I was going to say that uh, since a lot of these accept normal HTTP traffic, if you install them alongside Suricata or Snort, um, you can actually see a lot of the other stuff. You'll see the cold fusion scanners, you'll see the uh, cross-site scripting, the PHP, uh, you'll see a lot of that stuff happen. And as it turns out, uh, Snort and Suricata both have deploy scripts in modern HoneyNet. So you can deploy uh, Snort to a honeypot that you're already using, and then Snort will additionally report in those uh, alerts that it sees. Um, it doesn't look like, I, I was testing Suricata earlier this week, it doesn't really look like the Suricata stuff works just yet, uh, but I'm kind of working on that. So each honeypot that MHN supports has a corresponding deploy script, and this is just one deploy script. And you can see the script itself is down here, the actual syntax. The deploy command looks an awful lot like curl, pipe, sudo, bash. Um, and uh, each one of those scripts has basically five phases. Uh, registration creates a brand new entry in modern HoneyNet. Uh, it fetches the HP feeds credentials uh, so that it can publish the data. Uh, it prepares the environment, you know, installs dependencies, um, anything else that needs to prep. Uh, downloads the Honeypot software, uh, usually from Git or from a PPA repository uh, or RPM. Uh, does some configuration, and some of these things require a whole lot of extensive patching. Uh, I can't remember which one, but one of them you actually had to uh, patch HP feed support into the Honeypot. Uh, and so sometimes there's some fairly elaborate stuff going on on the configuration side. And then finally it installs it, uh, usually to slash opt. And then persistence. Uh, usually uses, all the MHN stuff uses supervisor for job control. And so, uh, uh, you know, if this almost sounds like a botnet, I totally agree with you. You're basically running a botnet of uh, Raspberry Pis and cloud nodes. So I won't walk through the whole install, but I stood up a vanilla Ubuntu server instance on Google Cloud. Um, 
compute engine just to kind of play around. And I ran the Calry deploy script. And you can kind of see down here uh, the command that I ran. And again, it does look a lot like sudo pipe curl bash, uh, or curl pipe sudo bash, whatever. Um, but once everything is done installing, which takes just a few minutes, you can log off. And like in this case, the, uh, the SSH honeypot takes over port 22. So it actually moves your SSH port to 2222. And you can kind of see some offline stuff there where it, where it redirects 22 and 23, uh, allowing them to be used by a non-root user. Uh, but if we look at the log file, we can see that Cowrie was started, and the first attacker hit it like a minute and a half later. Uh, when we looked at the log here. Uh, so from uh, 248 to 250, uh, we had a connection attempt and somebody was already trying to beat this thing up. So the HD feed subscription, you know, we talked about how the honeypots can push attack data to HP feeds. And it's a subscribe publish model. So from the subscription side of things, um, it allows you to attach to the HP feed service and just consume a constant fire hose of of uh, honeypot data. Uh, so this gives you a near real-time view of attacks. Uh, you can stream them to disk for analysis. It's in kind of an almost JSON type format. Uh, or you can parse it on the fly or even load it into a database. Uh, the way it's formatted, I think you might be able to replicate it into another HD feeds instance, which would be interesting, but I haven't played with that yet. <clears throat> so this is a quick animation. Uh, I'm going to let it cycle through because reasons. Uh, this is a quick animation of using the, installing and using the HP Feeds uh, Python client. So this is the reference client that's provided. Um, and I've got a link to the GitHub repository here later in the slides, I think. Um, so this is where we start. <clears throat> so I just do the git clone, uh, build it. This is my attempt at a live demo, OK. <laughs> With typos. Uh, and once you build it, you install it with sudo, and really then all you have to do is, uh, is run it with the right credentials. So here you can see the list of, uh, of feeds that we're going to consume, and you can see the community string, and you can cons and see the, uh, the list of those. And within a matter of seconds, we've got uh, Cowrie reporting in, uh, and this is all Mirai botnet traffic on port 22 and 23. <clears throat> so having direct access to MongoDB lets you, uh, gives you a lot of flexibility for reports. Uh, but uh, to kind of give you guys a general feel uh, for what, what all you can do, I decided to use just the HP feeds output. I streamed it to disk, I made it into CSV files, and I've got a thing tailing it into MySQL so I can run some slick reports. Um, and so, you know, one of them is just a stream parser that exports a minimalist timestamp CSV. Um, and so, I'm just storing C uh, the timestamps in MySQL so I can go back and just grab the last 24 hours. Um, you know, from there I made a summary of attacker IP addresses, how many different honeypots they hit, and how many total connections they made. Um, we've taken to calling the heavy hitter up here, uh, whatever is number one with 120, or I'm sorry, 12,900 hits. Uh, we call that one the Queen Bee. Uh, and so, uh, anyway, I asked for a bunch of volunteers a couple of weeks ago to, uh, uh, you know, to stand up some honeypots and point them at my MHN server, and uh, they turned out in force. So, you know what? Big props to all of these folks. They stood up, PMs, cloud instances. Uh, you know, they really helped me test this. I was just playing around uh, before I decided. You know what? Maybe the SetKC community would like to to see how this works. Um, and uh, I also worked a lot with uh, Brandon, a.k.a. Wintel, and I don't know where he's at, if he can... There he is. Cool. Uh, you know what, he was... Uh, uh, you know, we took a kind of sexy data viz project that I found on GitHub, and he was just a baller, and he uh, built some middleware and made a whole bunch of changes to it. And uh, here's an animated GIF of what he built. Uh, this thing is live feed of all of that. Uh, and uh, so, at the very top and down towards the bottom, and those uh, uh, satellite-looking things, those are the honeypots. Those are geolocated honeypots that we're running. Um, the push pins that are coming out of the globe, those are where the attackers are. Uh, the live feed of usernames and passwords that are being tried. Uh, 
This chart on the bottom is uh, the last 24 hours of the attacks. And you can see where my MongoDB died for a couple hours because I didn't have enough RAM on the EC2 instance. Uh, and then you've got the top attackers over here. And if you click on one of those, uh, you can see it show up on the map and with some more details, like which ports it comes up with. Um, all of this is really cool. It looks really slick. Uh, a whole bunch of Node, a whole bunch of Mongo, a little bit of Python. Uh, Brandon, thanks for all your help on that. That's been awesome. So if you want to help, if you want to get involved, uh, I plan on leaving this thing running. It's, it's going to cost me a little bit of money in EC2 because I had to bump up the RAM spec, but I'd love to, I'd love to just leave this thing running for everybody. Um, and so if you want to get involved, uh, Amazon has a free tier uh, of EC2. For one year, you can basically run a T2 Tiny uh, for a whole year uh, for free on EC2. Um, and that's more than enough to run a couple of, uh, a couple of different Honeypot softwares. Uh, Google Compute Engine has a $300 and one year free credit. Um, so I spun up a whole bunch of stuff. $300 goes a very long way on Google Compute Cloud. Uh, you can run Raspberry Pis at home. Just be mindful of your DMZ situation. And uh, I also need some help kind of testing and fixing some more of these deploy scripts. Um, I can, I can kind of pull this up afterwards and show you guys, but um, I, I could still use a little bit of help. I think there's some other Honeypot software that we could get working with this. Um, so if you, uh, and then also, uh, there's like Telnet Logger from David Graham. I'd really like to see if we could get uh, HP feed support added to it. It's fairly simple, but uh, I'm not a developer. I'm a, uh, like I said, I'm a tabby wrangler and breaker and fixer of things. Uh, but uh, yeah, go ahead and contact me if you want uh, to give us a hand or uh, need some help setting up the honeypots. And uh, you know what? These for everybody. Um, these are the uh, these are the credentials to get logged into the uh, to the live data feed. Um, we, we kind of took the ISC license, which looks a little bit like the MIT license, which looks a little bit like the BSD license, um, and basically said, do what you want with the HP feeds output, uh, just don't hold us accountable <laughs> um, you know, if, you, if you end up blocking something with it or, or whatnot. Um, but this is a read-only feed that anyone here can use, and you can just watch that feed of data come through. Um, but of course, you know, you might just want the, uh, the real deal here. So uh, I'll close out with just that on the screen and you guys can watch it as it goes live. Thanks, guys. Yeah.